today, most scientists are unaware of the literature that the zero-point energy even exists, mainly because most scientists aren't physicists. Now, a few of the, I went to school, and I became a PhD, claiming a PhD in electrical engineering and systems engineering, and not one professor ever heard of it. And yet, there it was in the library. So part of it is most scientists are specialists in their own area, and science today is very fragmented. Now, for those that know that the zero-point energy exists, they may argue, well, it's random in its nature, and therefore it can't be tapped as an energy source. But very recent work in thermodynamics by Ilya Prigogine, who won the Nobel Prize in 1978, shows how this energy could become self-organized if, if the proper systems conditions could be fulfilled. And that's what's happening in some of the experiments and some of the inventions that are tapping this, this energy and producing anomalous energy. Another resistance is the physics community, especially, that really know about this energy, realize if you could tap it, everything would change. The nature of physics would change. Uh, the, the most important foundation of all physics would then be the quantum, uh, the quantum energy that's in, embedded in space. And really, we don't understand it. And it's extremely mathematically difficult to do computations in it. And it turns out it's probably going to be the basis of string theory in the future. And therefore, what seems to be nothing will actually be understood as a field effect, as a tapping of um, energy that is already available but can't be seen. Um, even the radio waves, for example, the television set is a good example. Uh, if you show that to a primitive tribe, it looks like a magical box. But it's literally converting invisible energy in the air to, um, to signals and pictures. And the paddle wheel in the river that's used to power a mill, grind corn, is a free energy device. So is a windmill, for example. What we mean is we are taking the energy from an external source and using it. So it's an open system, and the, the environment of the system is furnishing a flow of energy into the system, which the system is then collecting and using. Primary requirements, it has to be an open system, it has to have an external source of energy to furnish the energy that we're going to use. And therefore, it's no more mysterious than a windmill. And now we're coming full circle and realizing that uh, physics and metaphysics, that um, some of the notions of the 19th century, such as the ether and the vortex, are now being dusted off. And those ideas are being melded with uh, modern experiments, plus quantum mechanics and so forth, into this magnificent a magnificent synthesis of what I call sacred science, of a whole new science, a whole new physics in which consciousness remains or reigns supreme. And where we don't have to follow any particular guru or a leader or anything like that, that we have everything we need in the universe that's ours to have right now. And these are some of the basic essence principles that lie underneath the discovery of free energy. The force of inertia is known in mechanics, but until only recently, it had been considered too weak and difficult to harness for propulsion. According to some theorists, like Hal Puthoff, inertia, like gravity, is what occurs when we try to accelerate an object against the zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum. We run into resistance, literally. Canadian inventor Roy Thornson has developed an inertial impulse propulsion engine which overcomes that resistance using centrifugal force. It pushes against nothing and emits no exhaust, but it's been calculated to be 20 times more efficient than a jet engine. Here, the Thornson inertial propulsion drive powers a canoe in a swimming pool. The motor, which is housed in a box, never contacts the water or air. In the pendulum test, unidirectional force is being generated to keep the pendulum to one side. Whether or not uh, we can demonstrate, as I have, with engineering analysis and, um, and models that will climb and incline, 
will pass a, a pendulum test, in other words, stay on one side of the pendulum consistently, and even power a canoe in a swimming pool, commercialization of that device is still a, a very difficult road. And we see that in many inventions, but what I like to emphasize is my F over P uh, measurement of that is literally 20 times better than the jet engine. A jet engine, typically a commercial jet engine, um, the DC-9, I think is the one that I analyzed, has about 0.016 newtons per watt. And then the, this is in the metric system. Now, when we look at the Thornson, he's able to achieve 0 0.3, 0 0.32 newtons per watt, literally 20 times better than the uh, jet engine. Roy Thornson is developing refinements to his system to increase its performance. Unfortunately, like many inventors, even with a U.S. patent in hand, he has yet to find sufficient investment capital to bring his motor to the marketplace. Propulsion force does in fact exist. We've all seen these little toy gizmos that demonstrate lightning in a bottle. It's the electric phenomenon called plasma discharge. Various inventors, working independently, are coming up with some exotic combinations of gases, metals, and processes to actually squeeze excess electrical energy out of this phenomenon of nature. In 1996, Paolo and Alexandra Correa received the first patent for such a device called the Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharge Reactor, the first of its kind to convert plasma discharge directly into electricity. This is a standard. Utah inventor Paul Pantone has developed what he calls the GEET fuel processor, a plasma generator similar to a super carburetor that actually appears to run on 80% water and is entirely non-polluting. This device replaces the carburetor and exhaust and combines them as one unit, whereas this end of it acts as a miniature refinery, allowing the engine to run on everything from battery acid and water mixed to crude oil right out of the ground. This is Angola crude, 39.5 gravity. The exhaust coming down goes around and comes out here at the far end. The center chamber draws some of the heat from the exhaust, plus this tube takes some of the exhaust gases, takes them up into the chamber and bubbles them down to the bottom. The bubbles, as it comes through the fuel, are brought up to the top of the chamber, picked up through a tube, and fed up the center of the exhaust pipe. While they're being fed up the exhaust pipe, they are in a vacuum, and there's a heat exchange which occurs. This process has been argument, argued a few times to be either a plasma field, an electro field. We do know that it does have a slight radiation, which is not alpha, beta, or gamma. And we do have x-rays to show that whatever is coming from the unit does get affected different from stainless steel than uh, the regular steel. Go. When the temperature of the exhaust is the same as the air temperature going in from the air portion up here, normally one, three percent more oxygen coming out of the tailpipe than there is in the air we're breathing. No carbon at all. Carbon vanishes. I wouldn't say vanishes. I would say transmuted into some other substance, a lighter element, because we have an abundance of lighter elements here that are not explained from down here. But during the heat process, uh, there are molecular changes. After running this engine from 1983 until now, and many times we had it running eight, eight, eight and a half hours a day, uh, we have never had to change the spark plug change the oil, or clean it. We have taken the head off three times to inspect the inside of it, and it's been spotless.